wave. Okay, because we weren't quite ready. We weren't quite ready to record, but it looks like you're going, and I'm going to get off mic. Okay. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you, Lori, and welcome to everybody. Just for your information, for those of you who came in late, we will make all these slides available to you at a later date, and Peg and I will be compiling a list of resources that you'll receive at the end of the third session. Let me introduce myself briefly. My name is Lois. I serve our Woodenville congregation, which is north and east of Seattle. I did the math earlier, or Peg did it for me, and I figured out I'm in my 31st year of ministry. I was in the United Church of Christ as a minister for years and years, doing work with youth and taking them different places in the world to enter into partnerships with folks doing projects in little villages that people had never heard of and chose Unitarian Universalism for reasons of religious and personal integrity. And my first position was halftime in Bozeman, Montana. So I'm familiar with the Mountain Desert District. And what else do you need to know? I think that's about it, what you need to know from me. Peg? Hi, I'm Peg Morgan, and I'm the minister at Westside Unitarian Universalist Congregation in West Seattle. I've been in ministry. Uh, I went to theological school in 1995 after I retired from a 30-year social work career. Like I had a lot more life and service to give to the world, and I had a passion for my faith, Unitary Universalism, and I've never regretted this decision. Um, I'm in my 13th year at Westside, and um, when I was in theological school, I was asked to do a project on lay pastoral ministry, so I've always had a passion for this topic also. So welcome, everyone, and a big thank you to Lori for getting us all here. If it wasn't for Lori, we wouldn't be here. Hey, Peg, this is embarrassing, but when I went to theological school, there was no such uh -huh. thing as a lay pastoral ministry that uh -huh. was taught or ever referenced. So that's a concept that's come in in the last, at least to my knowledge, in some of the denominations over the last 30 years. That, so. is, that is interesting. Um, Peter Rabel at University Church asked me to set up a program at University Church, which is where I was a member. And and uh, so I surveyed uh, not only our denomination, but other uh, denominations about how they ran their programs. And um, it was a, a fun thing to do. So interesting. All right. So we Let would us, like... We will light our chalice with the words of Reverend Gordon McKeeman, which is entitled, Ministry is All That We Do Together. Ministry is all we do together. Ministry is that quality of being in community that affirms human dignity. Beckons forth hidden possibilities, invites us into deeper, more constant, reverent relationships, and carries forward our heritage of hope and liberation. Ministry is what we do together as we celebrate triumphs of human spirit. Miracles of birth and life, wonders of devotion and sacrifice. Ministry is what we do together with one another. In terror and torment, in grief. In misery and pain, enabling us in the presence of death to say yes to life. We who minister speak and live the best we know with full knowledge that it is never quite enough and yet are reassured by wounds 
healed and joy shared. Ministry, Ministry is, is all, all that we, we do, do together. together. Sorry, friends, you can't do a reading, a line in unison. So this is a series of three sessions. Tonight is all about setting up the program. On November 20th, we come back together. We address the ministry of presence. We spend really the whole time pondering and uh going deep into what is presence. And then on December 18th, the third session, it will be considerations of managing your program, things about record keeping and legal and ethical practices and boundaries, provisions of resources, and ongoing training and care for your team. So now I will um, invite Lois to continue. Thank you, Peg. Why pastoral care? I'm hoping everybody can read these pretty well, but I'm going to repeat them. There are simple answers to this question. Why pastoral care? Because we all have times of brokenness, crisis, and pain because we all have times in our lives. So what is lay pastoral care? Two phrases. It is the care of the soul, and it is a ministry of presence and accompaniment. Peg talked about the fact that we're going to go into what it means to be present and the notion of presence in this capacity. And I just wanted to share with you what a former colleague said to me. She said, after 20, 25 years, she said, I finally realized that 90% of ministry is showing up for people, just showing up. What are the theological and spiritual underpinnings of pastoral care? It's so important. It's so important to have a clear understanding of the depths of what we're doing in pastoral care. How do we respond to people who are hurting, who are going through a tough time? Here is where it really matters what we believe. As the reading by Sophia Lyon Foz says in our hymnal, one of my favorites, it's number 657. You may remember it, it's entitled, It Matters What We Believe. And some of her words say that some beliefs are like blinders, shutting off the power to choose one's own direction. Some beliefs weaken a person's selfhood. They blight the growth of resourcefulness and other beliefs nurture self-confidence and enrich the feeling of personal worth. It matters what we believe as we are doing pastoral care. For how we think and feel about another person's troubles is about what we believe about the question, why do painful things happen to good people? Now, some people believe that painful things happen because of a devil or an evil force or because of karma for past behavior or punishment from a god. Others believe it's a test of your faith or just God's will. But what is the UU view? While we have different views on life and God, we have common hopes for ourselves and our planet. We would generally have an 
answers already stated, but instead would say that painful things happen because of choices that people make, like driving drunk, or conflict of human wills, like a fight that ends in injury, or confused or mentally ill behavior, such as people who have grown up with abuse and now project that abuse onto others. The biochemical interrelatedness of life is another reason that painful things happen. Viruses and bacteria make us sick. Excesses of certain kinds of food ingredients make us sick, like sugars. Biochemistry and imbalance such as some mental health problems. And forces of nature cause painful happenings, earthquakes, storms, and drought, or just being in the wrong place at the time. So things happen to us sometimes as a consequence of our choices, but more often for reasons that have nothing to do with our own actions and choices, often quite unjustly. In any and all cases, our response to when painful things happen to people is not to take the fatted calf to the altar to appease an angry and jealous God. It's not to do a rain dance to beseech the God of rain to let go. It's not to tell people that God wanted their baby in heaven. But rather, our response is to give compassionate presence. Reverend Bill Murray, who used to be the president of Meadville Lombard UU Theological School, wrote a book called A Faith for All Seasons. And what he said about suffering is that the universe does not judge nor does it mete out rewards and punishments. It simply is. The justice we will find is the justice we create. The answer to the problem of unjust suffering is not to be found by questioning God or the cosmos. The answer is our love. Love of life, love of the world in spite of its lack of justice, and the love we can give to one another, end of quote. Because we believe in the worth and dignity of each person and in the interdependence of our lives, we care about each other. We are built to care. If someone is hurting, the mirror neurons in our brain help us sense that hurting. We want to respond. We don't have to know how to fix another's problems. In the face of life's imponderables, all we should do is sit with another and love them. There is the story of the little girl sent by her mother on an errand. When she finally returned, her mother asked her what took her so long. A friend had fallen and broken his bicycle and she had stopped to help. But, her mother said, you don't know anything about fixing bicycles. I know, her daughter said. I stopped to help him cry. We help each other experience whatever we're feeling by just being present. And when we do, I believe there's another theological truth going on. I believe there is a yearning in each of us to share the most precious feelings that lie within us, deep within us, in our sacred heart place. Some would call it our soul place. I believe there is a common human longing to experience someone understanding us knowing and being kind about what is deep in our heart and soul. It is that makes us feel joy. It's a desire for spiritual intimacy 
and it's built into us. And there is something creative that happens when we share our truth with another. The energy between us is empowering. Some say that God is in that energy, in that process. Obviously not the God with the beard in the sky, but a life-affirming, life-giving power. The kind of power that makes us feel like getting up in the morning. And so there is a spiritual basis for our sharing and for being a good listener. We humans are participating in a most amazing cosmic process. We have come out of a miraculous, even if only partially understood creation and not so very long ago, really. And we are still trying to mature as a species. We are still trying to figure it out. The story of the world is still being told. The world is not done being created and what we do matters. We are trying our best to be human together. We laugh and we cry, we explore and we wonder, and we sometimes do things that cause hurt to others. And in this journey, we need companionship. We need the presence of others. And when we have it, we are transformed, both the listener and the speaker. And that, my friends, is what lay pastoral ministry is about and what your caring program can be. There is no finer service within our congregations. So Lois, do you have any other thoughts? <laughs> yeah, hard to. T I come back to what Karen Armstrong, that former Catholic theologian writer, says when she says, "Sort of the is compassion its core," and compassion literally means to suffer with. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's part of that spiritual or theological underpinning. And I guess the other thing to clarify is, I mean, as you said, Peg, I don't think we get to know why lots of stuff happens. It just happens. And the question isn't why so much is, but how are we going to survive it? And in lay pastoral ministry, we accompany one another in that journey, seeking and trying to find meaning when it can be found, because there are times when it is not. I believe you wanted to ask people to type in something at this point to see if anybody had anything else to add about what they might think the theological and spiritual underpinnings of this work might be. Is that right, Peg? Yes. So folks, um, feel free to start typing away in the chat box on the bottom left. It's going to be a little bit awkward because we're going to be quiet waiting for someone to start typing. And if you have nothing to add, that's okay. We will take it from where we left off. I think we, uh, you use, have a, uh, a history of being fix-it people. We're very good at getting out and trying to fix the world, uh, marching and changing systems and injustice work. Uh, when it comes to pastoral care, then we might still have uh, that that desire to fix another person's problems, and that really isn't what pastoral care is, is it? No, and um, Sonia says that, she writes that, I think we aim for a sense of connection and mirroring, which is to, I think, reflect back maybe what you see. Um, connection to the person who may be in pain. And I totally agree with what Peg is saying is we, there are things that can't be fixed and neither ministers nor, nor lay pastoral care folks can fix things. I think we can only stand with people and accompany them in their journeys. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, we we are a fix-it people, and there just are things that can't be fixed. And at the same time, the only thing that can be fixed is a person not being alone. Right. Anybody else have anything they want to type in? And if not, unless, Peg, you have something else to add about theological or spiritual underpinnings. No, I don't think so. All right, let's let's go on because what we're going to do is look at the differences between what some of you may have in your congregations, which my congregation um, calls cares and concerns. Uh, it's a committee. What's the difference between that and the kind of lay pastoral care that we're talking about? And I want to thank my colleagues, uh, the Reverend Sue Phillips and the Reverend Tandy Rogers for this particular slide that I have up here. This is from a presentation that they created to help people understand the differences. And I think they're very, very important differences. So a care and concern committee, for those of you who are on the phone, it's, those are the people that send cards to folks when they've heard that they're having a hard time or maybe they've had a child or they have been in the hospital. Maybe I don't know how many people send flowers anymore. We are trying to send prayer flags to people when they're hospitalized because so many people are not able to have flowers or have allergies to them. I just want to go back. Sorry, I'm interrupting myself here because Joan typed in from Tacoma. And it, this is in their definition or their understanding of the spiritual underpinnings for the work that we're talking about. And they say, sometimes it's just presence, being there for someone, no need to talk, just be there. And I am sure that Peg and I will talk more about that presence and the silence uh, next week, uh, the next time that we talk about all of this. So going back to a care committee or cares and concerns committee, they'll often arrange for meals for folks who uh, transportation, maybe to church or to doctor's appointments. And our congregation, I'm sure many of yours do, organizes like a medical equipment loan program where people can borrow different med- kinds of medical equipment when they have a particular need. And that's in contrast to the kind of lay pastoral care that Peg and I are talking about. And those who are involved in that provide a listening presence for people who may be ill or are in the hospital, who may be in care facilities or may be homebound, who may be experiencing an illness. And for folks who may be in crisis. And both Peg and I want to clarify what we mean by crisis, because as we were talking about this, it became clear that one person's crisis is just another person's hiccup. But I think what I mean is that there has been a traumatic event, something that's happened that interrupts the flow of a person's life. And that is a crisis. Um, That's what I mean by crisis. And sometimes it's not appropriate for lay folks to respond to that unless they've had particular training or are professionals in that field. And sometimes it's not even appropriate for clergy to be responding and need to bring in other professionals. Peg, do you want to add to that about crisis? There are so many different kinds. Uh, I think in general, crisis is something that when something happens to us, we're trying to figure out it's new and we don't know how to behave or act with that new um, awareness in our life. So that creates a crisis. So there mm-hmm. could be some that are very appropriate for um, lay pastoral care people. Um, maybe someone in the congregation has just discovered uh, a lump in their breast. Uh, they're, they're nervous and they're moving ahead with medical processes, but they just want to talk to someone about how scary it feels. Mm-hmm. So, and, yeah, go ahead. I just was curious if anybody who is listening in on this or watching or viewing this slide has any other 
knows of any other kind of ways that we differentiate a care committee from the work of lay pastoral care. And you can just type it into the box and uh, we'll interrupt ourselves to attend to it. In the meantime, have we said all we want to about this, Peg? Yes. Okay. Let's move us on. So what qualities should a pastoral care person possess? It's so important who becomes a pastoral care person because um, the kinds of people that you choose in a congregation to do this ministry, um, their their reputations and their um, already their interrelationships with and reputations in the congregation uh, make a big difference about how people perceive the program. So you want them to have reputations and you want them to be trustworthy and to have integrity. You want them to have the ability to keep confidences and good boundaries. And they need to understand that if they become a lay pastoral uh, volunteer, that changes some of how they are in the congregation because that boundary issue is really important. You you don't want one of your lay pastoral ministers to be um, gossiping around about what folks are doing because then other folks may not think that they can trust them if they're approaching in their role as lay pastor. So. Um, it does change your relationship with, with the congregation. Uh, you want them to have a calm presence. Um, you want them to be able to deeply listen, and we'll talk more about that next time. They need to have energy for the task. Um, and a bit of life experience is helpful. Um, having been through a few uh, ups and downs in life, I think is helpful. Um, and having interpersonal and intrapersonal skills, that relationship with others and the relationship with your own self. Um, being loving and kind and compassionate. And then the ability to relate to diverse people and ages and circumstances because the congregation is diverse. So that's another good quality. Um, um, can I add something, Peg? Yeah, and then I see we have some comments there too. Yeah, I want to get back to that one in particular from Sonia. When you were talking about qualities, perfection is not one of them. As Peg said, life experience is probably far more important than perfection. The folks that I've worked with have always been surprised when I've asked them to be a lay pastoral associate, which is what we call them in my congregation. And I know that they've been through things. I also know that they're on the other side of those experiences. So I mean, yes, sometimes you're working with somebody and it brings up your own stuff that we call a trigger. Mm -hmm. But the folks that you pick should probably have been through an experience and are pretty much have a lot of distance from it or on the other side of it. And just one more thing to throw in there is just to remember it's not therapy. We are not professional counselors, mental health professionals that come in to fix anything. It really is about presence and listening and accompaniment. And to respond to Sonia, who wrote, for those of you who are on the phone, at the Berkeley Church, we have a minister available after the service to listen to concerns people have. And it's pointed out that um, all those folks are ordained, those who are doing the listening. Our colleague, uh, Rick Davis, who is the Unitarian Universalist minister in Salem, Oregon, started a practice in his congregation called Compassionate Connection. And after the service, anybody who desires can come 
and join a small circle, be part of a small circle, and step into the center of that circle and they can state what it is that they would like to lift up or they can just be there to receive prayers, blessings, whatever you want to call it from the group. And in my congregation, the lay pastoral associates are doing that as well. And it seems to be really helpful to folks just to have a place to be and to, if not necessarily heard, but seen. Hmm. That sounds wonderful. Something they can uh, count on. Yeah, and it's pretty powerful to be both on the, the person who is outside the circle, a part of it, and, and a person who's in the center of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I just, uh, I just got that. The, the lots of uh, notes. Of course, I didn't write that mm -hmm. up. Um, Rick, I really need to thank Rick for this, and I think he does a better job of it than I do at times and that we do. But I also just want to say as an aside, for those of you who still do the sharing of the joys and sorrows of your lives in a worship service, it helps more people be able to share those joys or sorrows because not everyone is able to stand up and publicly name them. It gives some privacy. It just lets it just opens up the sharing into uh, gives more people options. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will try to remember huh, to send that in the notes. Thank you, Tahoma. Uh, Lois, you're mentioning the value of life experience, and then the value of being far enough through the experience to have uh, maybe more objectivity there or. Perhaps um, you wouldn't be um, projecting yourself on the person. It, that, that's um, a really important point and something that in the process of the, of the training of lay pastoral people, it's good to have a piece of paper where people ponder, what is it that I have been through and Am I ready uh, if I were going to be sitting with someone else? Is it too soon or is it just right? Uh, to have people self-reflect on that very question that you, you mentioned. And I'm sure we'll get back to this again, but just as important to know if you're on the other side of something or not, once you, you may accompany people through some things that afterwards you just sort of feel like you need to release what you've been around. So it's really important to be able to practice self-care afterwards and do what you need to take care of yourself after you have sat with someone. Even if you haven't, even if it's not triggering something from your past, some experiences are just brutal to be around. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Should we the go care, on? The, care of the caregiver. Yeah, yeah. And we will talk more about that, especially around boundaries. Mm -hmm. We ready to move on? Okay. Okay. So what are the key questions for setting up a program? Some of you may already have a program. Some of you may be in a smaller, only lay-led congregation, and or maybe you're trying to adjust a program that you have, or maybe you're just considering, I think, like North Lake and Kirkland is, the possibilities of having lay pastoral care folks in their congregation. So one of the most important things, I think, to ask is, so what do you want it to be? What's your vision of pastoral care for your congregation? Is that part of your congregation's vision or need? How will it play out in your congregation? What kinds of care programs do you already have in place in your congregation? And how will these programs interact with you? And what are the sources of care in your congregations? And that could be anything from a care team that you already have in place. It could even just be folks who, by their profession, 
are able to help when folks are in times of crisis. And the other thing to look at when you are considering setting up a program is to see how are folks being ministered to at the present time. Are there people in the congregation, if you are entirely lay led, or even if you're not actually, that people just naturally go to to talk about what's on their minds? Is the pastoral care limited if you have a minister only to Hang on, I'm getting a, a, a message about moving my mic away from my mouth. I'm hoping that makes the sound better for you all. Is it only the clergy that do the care, or are lay folks or other professionals in the congregation involved? Anything you want to comment on with that, Peg? Yes, uh I think as we develop a lay pastoral presence ministry, it's important that what we're doing, and I think what Lois is, is saying here, is that there are other programs going on right now, and we don't want to take away from the value of what's going on already, and also the informal uh, presence that people give to each other just naturally. We want that to continue the lay pastoral program being organized is in part to make sure that no one falls through the cracks, that no one gets lost, um, that maybe the quieter ones don't have anyone giving that informal presence. Agreed. Okay. Are we ready for more questions? Yeah, I think you should hit the next slide. How will this program fit your congregation's mission and overall programming? That's always an interesting question. It seems that every program that we develop in a congregation should relate to our mission. Um, and hopefully we all have uh, missions that we we are really supporting. Um, I will... In preparation for tonight, I, I went back to look at Westside's mission, make sure that, that we're in there in, in terms of caring programs. And I was happy to see that the first line of our mission is, we are a caring community that celebrates and respects the diversity of individuals. So that's just a, just a linkage in our organizational development that we want to think about. It's funny, Peg, because at the Woodenville Congregation, that language is really not in the mission statement yet. If mm -hmm. you would ask the community to characterize itself, they would say that uh -huh. they, care, they care for one another and they care for the world. And uh, just to remind people that a mission statement is simply a, a reason for being. What is your congregation's reason for being? And most UU congregations seem to be <laughs> not just to take care of one another and provide community for people who may be disaffected from their religions of origin, but also to care deeply and to transform and care for our world. And the other thing that they say is that if mission is your reason for being, then ministry is everything that you do in support of that mission. Good. So who will this team be accountable to? There may be some congregations listening in tonight that don't have ministers. I'm not sure about that. But if there is a minister, then I believe that this program should uh, be accountable to and, and supported and supervised by the minister. But if there isn't a minister, um, other options are certainly available. Um, perhaps it's one of your members who's a human service professional that could be the overall supervisor of this program. Making clear, though, in their supervision that that they're, if they're a therapist, they're not trying to have the lay pastoral people be therapists, but they understand the depth of human 
human uh, compassion and and trouble so that they would be very good at supervising such a program. And um, another option is contracting with an outside consulting minister for this particular program. Lois, did you have any other thoughts about you know, it's a, it's, it's a, I mean, I think even in a congregation that has a minister, this is an important question, um, just to make sure people understand that this team works closely with the minister, is trained by the minister, um, meets regularly with the minister, that kind of thing. The other, when, when Peg said to potentially contract with a consulting minister, given the technology that we do have available to us now, it would even be possible to have the care team meet via an online platform such as any meeting or Zoom or Skype or I, I, maybe not Skype, I don't know, but all there are lots of options to work with someone, consult with someone who may not even be in their state. That's all I have all right. for that one. Mm -hmm. I think that what name we call our program is important and I think each congregation has its own culture and and so there's no one right name but there are a number of names that that have been chosen by different lay pastoral teams around the country and I think Lois has a number of those that she's going to tell us so you, Lois, one, or? yep I do have it so lay ministry program a parish visitors program Lay Chaplaincy, Lay Pastoral Care Program, the Pastoral Care Team, Chaplains, Lay Pastoral Associates, Parish Visitors, Pastoral Listeners. And I just want to reiterate that language is important and it should fit the culture of your congregation. Yeah, and but that that's not an exhaustive list. We just wanted to throw out some options for you to, and how you're thinking about it. You may come up with something that doesn't even vaguely relate to that any of the ones that we've mentioned. And if you have other ideas, you might type them into the chat line. Our lay pastoral program at Westside began with the idea that we would be called uh, pastoral listeners but as we got into it we decided that we wanted to be called pastoral uh, pastoral visitors instead just because in our culture we thought that might feel safer to people that we're going to come and visit with you we're not coming to to listen to you just a subtle difference but you just want to look at your culture and think about what what the subtleties would be for you. And likewise, in the Woodenville congregation, we were intentional about saying lay pastoral associates to imply that they were working closely with the minister mm -hmm. to help provide the umbrella of care. Good. Then there's the question of how will you receive referrals and how will you promote the program? And if one of the major pro, uh, questions you have to answer is if you if you do have a, a minister, should all the referrals come through the minister or not? If all the referrals don't come through the minister, if you let your lay pastoral associates um, kind of get self-referrals, like during social hour, someone approaches them and says, I'd like to spend some time with you. I'd like you to spend some time with me. I've got something on my mind. Um, then I think that the minister should always know about who the team is seeing. I think there are, can be too many complications if if they don't. But that's a major question is where do the referrals come from um, and if and how to promote, which is their related questions. Some of the ways that you can promote are, of course, newsletter and order service and um, 
I think Facebook was even mentioned um, talking about the the program on Facebook. Um, one powerful way of preparing the congregation for this rich program that's available to them is by having a service that is on the topic of listening presence, given that all of us, everyone in the congregation can benefit from doing a little more thinking about how could I be present to people in my life. So having that service and then also installing your, in some kind of ritual, your lay pastoral uh, people uh, in a way that the congregation is, is saying, we recognize you've now been through this training and you are now available to serve us in this way. Um, other ways are identifying themselves by their name tags, uh, posters. Uh, some congregations have their lay, lay pastoral people handle the joys and sorrows during services. And uh, some have them follow up on the, the joys and sorrows that, that are, are named. Um, any other ideas, Lois? Well, um, you know, I was thinking that one of the things that the lay pastoral associates can do is to, quote, sponsor a program or a workshop within the church and the congregation. For instance, um, in Washington, we have what's known as the Five Wishes document, which outlines a person's wishes uh, for end-of-life care, et cetera, et cetera. These are really important document, not just documents, but conversations to be having. Um, we had, before we had a lay pastoral associates, we had the cares and concerns committee sponsor a workshop on um, uh, decluttering because sometimes that can be a real issue. But I'm just saying that it, you don't have to pick either topic, but to have the lay pastoral associates or the care team sponsor some sort of workshop or maybe something on death and dying or something on, ugh, what am I thinking of? Care, being a caregiver. That's another way mm -hmm. to get it out there. Um, the other way that I constantly advertise the lay pastoral folks in my congregation is that whenever I'm gone for a professional or vacation, um, my signature on my email lets people know I'm out of town and it says in case of a pastoral need please contact these individuals so that's how I do it I also want to just add something else you know there are always well-intentioned people in our congregations this has to do with referrals who are kind of you know nosing around or know something about somebody and then want to pass that information on and uh, can either blow things out of proportion or break confidence or try to get people involved, um, maybe when folks want privacy. So like if someone comes to you and says, hey, I'm really worried about so-and-so, that's not exactly a referral. You get my, catch my drift, it's sort of considered the source. And something else I just wanted to say is that there may be a situation that's public and you may have different teams of folks or different committees or different ways that your congregation does ministry. And you might have people overlapping or actually um, doubling up on efforts or making calls to an already stressed individual or family. So it's really important to have a lead or one person be the point of contact in a, with a family or an individual and that mm -hmm. that person then communicates to other folks on the care teams or the the rest of the congregation. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important, Lois. Um, at Westside, we've developed a program called, uh, it, as part of our care team, that is uh, has a number of people who are agreeing to be care coordinators. So a couple times a year, they agree that they will on um, someone's coordination of care, and that's when the, it's someone that has that's going to need ongoing, not just one or two things, but maybe for six weeks they'll need some meals and rides, and um, so everything focuses with that care coordinator. Mm-hmm. 
Anybody else? If you have ideas about how you think referrals would get passed along or how to promote the program in your congregations, please feel free to enter it into the chat box. You want to head on, Peg, or do you have anything else to add? I don't have anything else to add. I was just watching the notes to see if anyone has any other ideas. Ah, excellent question. Go ahead, Peg. How do care and concerns work with lay pastoral care? I think sometimes care and concerns um, uncover a need for lay pastoral care, and so they um, they contact one of the lay pastoral people, and it goes both ways. Uh, the lay pastoral people often find that there are when they're visiting and and finding out about the person's life, they find out that they could use some practical hands-on help. So it's it's really a synergism between the two groups. I, I my my short answer is very intentionally really need to be clear about what is appropriate for a care team, a care and concern team versus a lay pastoral care team and to make sure that um, that those boundaries are respected and that information that can be shared or needs to be shared is shared. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so, next. yeah, the job description. What is it exactly? I think we've hit it on the head many times. We keep talking about presence. We say that you should maybe be around to offer an opportunity for someone to talk. You know, you might, somebody might get up during joys and sorrows and or whatever you call it in your congregation and talk about an experience that they're going through. And maybe you as the, the lay caregiver actually has been through that, or you can talk to them and say, um, there are some other folks in the congregation that have been through what you've been through. Can I send your name? Can I have them contact you? That kind of thing. Again, to offer empathy, compassion, emotional support. And depending on who it is, that person might need to be prayed with or ask you to sit in meditation with them or to provide other kinds of spiritual support. And what's important is that you have a sense of your own spiritual practice so that even if what they're asking of you isn't your practice, you honor it. I, I find that folks who have a, a sense of what it is that keeps, nurtures them spiritually are far more able to be in the presence of folks who may not share that same path. And to nurture that, um, I was in a class with a really wonderful Zen teacher who started the first Zen AIDS hospice in San Francisco in the 80s, and he talked about before going in the room to start already to be in meditation, and as soon as his hand is on the knob of that door, he is stopping for a moment to prepare himself and then open the door and go in almost in a state of meditation to be with somebody. The other thing that we can do, or part of what I think the job description is, is to be able to refer people to other resources because there are folks who need professional help. Maybe it's mental health uh, referrals. Maybe it's physical ailments. Maybe it's like this problem of hoarding, but may maybe it's legal help that they need. So can you, if you don't know, tell them you will try and find other people that you can refer them to to work on what's going on for them. Anything you want to add to that, Peg? Uh, that's where it's really helpful to have uh, people in the congregation that can be your consultants on um, different resources. So I have a couple psychologists that I can call and say, who's good at this particular issue or what's a resource for that? And social workers can be helpful. And yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's go. And are we okay on that slide? Uh huh.
This is one of my favorite parts, Lois. <laughs> this slide or what's, the focus? What's coming, what's coming next? All right. So it's very simple, my friends. What is the focus in pastoral care? On being. I have a little coin that my partner gave me, and on one side it says be, and the other one it says do. And <laughs> Flip that coin when you're in this role to be to go on being, on being present, and on being focused and present to the other. You know, a lot of people, you probably know this, when you're telling them something that's been going on in your life, they want to tell you their story. Or when you're in the hospital, they come to visit you and they start talking about their experiences of when they were in the hospital. And frankly, that's not particularly helpful. It's not mm -hmm. about you, as I like to say. It's it, mm -hmm. it's them. It's about almost being um, a blank wall, if you will, a clean board that they can put their what's going on with them out on. That's hard though. It's hard because sometimes we get anxious and when they're talking about their problem and it's easier just to fill the, fill the air, fill, fill the, uh, you know, the space with our own story then. Uh, so I'm, I'm just naming that it's hard. This is not, easy but it's precious <laughs> perfectly put <laughs> it's a practice yes it is a practice how do we choose these people that are going to do this precious work i think we want to be aiming for diversity from the congregation. We want some young people. We want some older people. We want all different kinds of, of demographics, uh, racial, um, moms, dads. That just makes sense because then there's more people that are going to feel like, oh, there's someone there I can talk to. We and I would also... I really think it's important to have gender considerations, and um, I don't just mean the typical ways we've talked about gender, male or female, but if not somebody who identifies as queer or somewhere on the spectrum, then somebody who is at least familiar with those kinds of issues that – because so many um, – parents, for instance, in our congregations are having their children now identify as queer or trans, and it's a very specific kind of support that they need, so it's really helpful that we have some sort of representation in that way. Go ahead, Peg. Thanks. Thank you for adding that. And, uh, and then there's the question of applications versus appointments, and I really have a bias on this myself, having been through um, processes where we put it out to the congregation, not not where I'm at currently, but in the past, um, would you like to be a lay pastoral associate? And, and then here's an application, and then we did interviews, versus the, the way of deciding for yourself, who do you think in the congregation uh, are the right people for this. Now, you don't need to do that in a vacuum, but my bias is to not do the applications because I think you can hurt people's feelings in, and this is precious work. And then to say, no, I don't want you, 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 it's just, it gets complicated and sticky. But what I like, uh, what worked best for us recently was to, uh, put out to the congregation the question of who do you naturally tend to talk to within the congregation if you had something on your mind. And we got all these names and duplication of some names. We really got a sense from throughout the congregation. Um, so there was some diversity in that too then. 
Um, and that worked better to take all those ideas and then whittle, whittle it down. Uh, people didn't necessarily even know that they were named by others. Uh, Lois, do you want to add anything there? I'm afraid that um, we're not going to give you a diversity of opinion on this. I absolutely believe that people should be selected or invited onto the team. I know that there are other congregations that have an application process, which brings us back to that question from to the Tahoma congregation about can we speak to how to turn someone down when they ask to be a part of the team. Do you want to address that first, Peg? Boy. <laughs> um, I think that at the church that we were at, we the way we did it was that we had so many positions and and that there there were some people that uh, we just had to say we had so many applicants. Thank you. Um, but it it I don't think it's it's just not a good thing to have to be in the position to do. So I wouldn't put myself in that position again. But you might. We uh, so the question is. So what happens though if someone just comes up to you and says, "Hey, you know, I really want to be a part of this team." Um, what the. But- but if they're appointed, then what if someone just asks about, that's what I'm doing. So if someone comes up and says, hey, I know we've got this program. I really want to be on this team. What do you do about that? Um, I'm at this point now where I've decided that there are times when it's not helpful to people when we don't tell, speak truthfully. I don't mean in a way to hurt them, but to say that, you know, this isn't a fit. And if they want to know why, and if you think they can actually hear it, try to work with them on that. Try and talk about another way that they can be involved. Um, And sometimes you just have to draw the line and say that's not an option or it's not – It's we can – that's not how we best want to have you involved in the congregation. And I think you have to take it case by case. Yeah. Uncomfortable. There may be another care role that they can take. Right. I would really I would really want to see what their gifts are and, and try to um to them in a different place. What if they're appointed? Then what if someone just asks yeah. Oh, you mean yeah, so yeah, there's well, already yeah, already no. a team appointment. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, Great question. <laughs> yeah. And then the question, that, yeah, who do people naturally turn to? Yeah. That's. I think so. that's brilliant that you came up with that. Um, thanks for saying that I covered it. I mean, I think there are probably people in all of our congregations who would like to be in positions that they, it's just not appropriate for them to be in. So it's a, it's not just a question of, the lay pastor or the lay care team, it's how do we deal with folks who may be mentally ill or well-intentioned but just are not able or maybe are no longer able because of uh, aging or whatever Uh reasons. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, it's a larger issue, frankly. I mean, it's actually a pastoral care issue. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm I'm aware that it's 806, and we want to make sure that these folks get. Oh, is there anything else we have to add on this one, Peg? Yeah, I think there's another yeah. slide for you, right? No. Um, we we have been yapping and yapping at you all, and really want to be able to answer questions. And so, could you, if you all have questions, would you please please type them into the chat box? And um, Peg's going to tell jokes or something until we get those. <laughs> I'm hoping. Did you hear the time? No. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I'm very hopeful that somebody will chat. Oh, okay. Uh Bye, Sonia. Hopefully see you um, another time. Quiet bunch of you all out there tonight, aren't you?
Thanks for joining us, Sonia. <laughs> Um, here's what I'm interested in, actually, knowing from all of you. I don't know if – I'm curious of how many of you out there actually already have these programs in place. How do you avoid the perception that receiving lay care – oh, let me – I have to digress for a moment. I once served on a congregation where I was the associate minister. This was There was a senior minister and a parish nurse, and if all three of us didn't come visit the person mm. – then they were insulted, and mm. it was a it was it was um, they were they felt slighted, and it was really hard. And so what we had to do is just to say that you know Peg's the lead on this one, and she will be the one interacting with you, or wow, Lois knows that person, she will be the one. So to say um, that it's not about being inferior. I mean, some people would rather talk to not talk to their minister, but have a, a, a peer that they can talk to. And to say that um, due to the fact that we all have very busy lives or loads, that we are doing shared ministry between the lay folk and the minister, and that different people will be taking the lead in different situations. That That's my, you know, shooting from the hip mm -hmm. response. What do you think, Peg? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's good, and I think uh, there are ways that we can uh, speak really highly of the the quality of of services from the maybe it kind of rises up in people's um, opinion uh, so that they might be more open. And I agree with you that sometimes people don't want to talk to the minister; uh, they would rather talk to one of the lay people so sometimes i even uh people people can make the choice would you like to have this person or this kind you know this service or or the minister so great question from calgary what sort of initial training should be offered for lay pastoral caregivers um we're getting into that aren't we in the next time peg i mean yes um okay. yeah I think I think we'll get into it next time. I, I we're, do. We're also getting into it a lot in the third session. Okay. But so, the primary thing is presence is 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 practice in in listening presence. I I do want to put out one resource tonight. It has been put together by the Reverend Barbara Myers. Um, she is at the Mission Peak Congregation in Fremont. And I believe she put this together. No, that's not where she did it. Okay. To make a long story short, she has put together a phenomenal uh, lay pastoral care guide. And ironically, she says that they're now in the process of revising it. But she will she has like a page that would say, for instance, how to um, deal with, with someone who in the aftermath of a suicide, uh, the death of a beloved pet, uh, divorce, uh, loss of a child, uh, uh, an abortion, those kinds of things, and it's a great resource that she asked for a donation. So it's a uh, Mission mm. Peak, Reverend Barbara Myers, um, and and but Peg and I will go through as much as we can in the next two sessions. Um, other core topics. Yeah, other core topics will be uh, boundaries and ethics and legalities. Um, uh, reporting, what what reports you want to keep uh, or you don't want to keep, um, things like that. So, so I think that that is essential, the sort of the legalese, if you will, about, you know, what do you do if or when and what, what do we have to abide by? What are the legally or just within the covenants of the congregation? As Peg, we keep coming back to what it means to be present, to listen, how to do good self-care, how to set up boundaries, to know when you're in over your head. I mean, even when you're in the middle of talking with someone, if it's just too much to be able to say, you know what, I, I need you to stop right now. I, I feel like this isn't, I'm not able to offer you what you might need right now, and I'd like to refer you to blah, blah, blah. I mean, that can often happen when folks are really in having a 
I'm not going to say a mental break, but just really distraught or overwrought. Um, I would really encourage, I think it's really important to learn to what I call refer, refer, refer. I think what we're, what we'll get into this again, but you are there not in an ongoing way to be in place of a therapist or a family or a partner or friends. You are there uh, maybe in intensity for short periods of time, not uh, continuing ongoing in depth presence to somebody. So I'm getting the feedback. Yeah. I am so sorry. Let me see if I could do this better. Well, what you were saying is that we're not seeing people in the lay pastoral program. We're not seeing people for a long, long time. It's it's a shorter term presence and referring out if need be. Right. That initially it may be a very high intensity time that we're we're involved. It's a very intense but short amount of time that we are involved with somebody or a family mm -hmm. or a situation, but we do not then take the place of a therapist or a family or friends or partners. We don't, um, we're not doing ongoing therapy. Mm -hmm. We're not mm -hmm. trying to change things or cure things. You know, it was interesting. I talked with a colleague, um, in the Mountain Desert District, for that matter, for those of you who are out that way, who had a great uh, point and talked about as as ministers, yes, we are to accompany and be present, yet there's a difference between enabling people by doing that over a long period and isn't the goal transformation hopefully for people. It's not something that we do to them or for them, but sort of uh, lay the groundwork for. And I think somebody said it earlier about mirroring. Mm -hmm. I think uh, when we are with someone and listening and we're empty of our own agendas, then we can really mirror what they're they can see, they can hear themselves because we're empty and we're listening. That makes any sense? Yeah, I often say to couples who I am marrying that um, in relationships, we hold the mirror for one another so that we can mm -hmm. see ourselves clearly. And mm -hmm. I think we're trying to do that. And I think that going back to what I said earlier about preparing, being prepared before you go to, into any of these kinds of encounters or conversations, to do what Peg said, to be very centered or clear and settled and calm and where you are. Any other questions that you all have at the moment? Well, huh. maybe maybe it's time for us to um, close the session. What what Lori would like everyone to know is that we should always give credit where credit is due. So the photos that were used in this were taken from Flickr, which has something called the Creative Commons, where people can download photos if that person has given them has given uh, their permission. So that's what that slide is about, an educational tool, which brings us then to our closing and our chalice extinguishing. In words that we cherish from Albert Schweitzer, at times our own light goes out and is rekindled by the spark from another person 
we each have cause to think gratefully of those who have lighted the flame within us. Thank you everyone for being present and we hope to see you in November and December and feel free to contact us uh, with questions ahead of time if you've got them. Good night and be well everyone. Mm -hmm.